provisional government seized power in March 1917. Revolutionary councils, known as Soviets, which were formed in the main cities, called for the imperial family's arrest. Nicholas II, henceforth Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, and his family were detained at their summer palace in Tsarkoi Selo. He thought that following his abdication, he'd be able to live in Crimea like any ordinary citizen. That was his first proposal. Later, in agreement with the provisional government, it was planned he and his family would leave Russia. Discussions were held with Great Britain, but unfortunately it finally decided against helping Nicholas II. In fact, it was Nicholas's own first cousin, King George V of England, who rejected the Russian government's official request. He feared his support for a deposed emperor would weaken the British monarchy. All the more so because strikes and social movements were gaining ground in England thanks to the impact of the Russian Revolution on left-wing political circles. Other European countries, including France, also refused, for various reasons, to offer asylum to the Romanovs, who found themselves at the mercy of an ever more radical revolution. Nicholas's abdication only calmed the situation momentarily. Demonstrations soon spread. Calls for democracy were replaced by Bolshevik slogans. The troops refused to continue a war begun by a man they now referred to as the Tyrant. The Soviets called for Nicholas II's execution. The Minister of Justice, Alexander Kerensky, refused their demands. He replied bombastically that he did not wish to be the Marat of the Russian Revolution. A radical socialist, he became Prime Minister and Minister of War in July. He felt sympathetic towards the imperial family and decided it was no longer safe for them to remain so close to Petrograd. The Soviets had blockaded the railway, and so he chose to exile the family to Tobolsk, a peaceful Siberian town far away from the revolutionary madness. The family left Tsarkoi Selo during the night of August 1, 1917, and after six days' journey, arrived in Tobolsk by boat. They moved into the town governor's house. Once a day, the Romanovs were allowed to take a stroll in the courtyard that was surrounded by a high fence. Their domestic staff was reduced to the minimum. They had no more money. The inhabitants of Tobolsk, who still thought of Nicholas II as Tsar, provided the family with milk, eggs and fruit. The Romanovs spent their time reading and writing. Although Vladimir Ilyich Lenin doubted the abdication in the February Revolution would have any lasting effects, he left his place of exile. His journey from Switzerland was arranged by the Germans who were counting on Lenin and Bolshevik propaganda to put a stop to the war. Lenin got to St. Petersburg in April, with the Germans' help. They knew exactly what they were doing. They helped spread the revolution in Russia. The Bolsheviks seized power in Petrograd on October 25, 1917. The provisional government was powerless to prevent the coup d'etat, even though it did not have the full support of the people.
conservatives and socialists tried to organize the opposition in order to regain control. The Bolsheviks formed the Red Army, mobilizing it a few months later. In order to supply much needed food to the major cities, the new regime's secret police, or Cheka, forcibly confiscated the peasants' hidden wheat supplies. A few months earlier, Lenin and the Bolshevik party had seized power in the name of these peasants, who soon became the victims of the new regime. From 1918 onwards, the Bolsheviks chose terror as their preferred method of government. They hounded any individual considered likely to turn against them. And so began a wave of mass arrests and summary executions. The prisons filled up. The first gulags were built. Whole trainloads of people were sent north. Nicholas II's situation became increasingly precarious. The Commissar of War, Leon Trotsky, who was a far more popular figure than Lenin, called for the bloody tyrant's trial in 1918. Inspired by the French Revolution of 1789, he intended to stage a spectacular trial with himself as public prosecutor, which would put an end to any remaining support for the monarchy in Russia. He knew such a trial would have significant repercussions, particularly since the Bolsheviks had begun a nationwide campaign to destroy the symbols of the former regime. Trotsky sent a regiment of Czechists to Tobolsk, led by the revolutionary Vasily Yakovlev, who carried a warrant signed by Lenin. Their mission was to bring Nicholas back to Moscow. But the Soviet of Yekaterinburg, capital of the Urals, wanted Nicholas to be tried in Siberia. It hijacked Yakovlev's train. On hearing the train's destination had been changed, Nicholas declared, I'll go anywhere except the Urals. He felt fear for the first time. The Romanovs arrived in Yekaterinburg on April 30, 1918. The conditions of their imprisonment confirmed their worst fears. Held in the home of a local merchant called Ipatiev, they suffered at the hands of their guards who allowed them no privacy covered the walls with obscenities, repeatedly searched the rooms, and stole everything they could. Nicholas drew the layout of the apartment in his diary. They had never lived in such close quarters before. The four grand duchesses shared one room, and Nicholas and Alexandra shared theirs with Alexei. At the beginning of July, the Ural Soviet appointed a new chief of detachment, Yakov Yurovsky. A Bolshevik and member of the Cheka, he was responsible for guarding Ipatiev's house. As the noose tightened around the imperial family, the Bolshevik situation also worsened. Thanks to foreign aid, the counter-revolutionaries, or whites, had successfully organized themselves and were now fighting on the northern, southern and eastern fronts. At Omsk, where many members of the Russian aristocracy had taken refuge, an anti-Bolshevik coalition formed the Provisional Government of Siberia. 
Yekaterinburg, which was held by the Reds, found itself in danger. It was obvious that the Whites were heading towards Yekaterinburg. No one knew how much time was left. Two weeks, maybe a month. Yekaterinburg was bound to fall, and the question was what should be done with the Tsar. We had no written documents about the discussions, but it's thought Nicholas II's fate was decided at this point and that Moscow had no objections to his being executed. The decision to execute the Tsar was taken with Lenin and Sverdlov's full agreement. Goloshokin, the regional military commissar, went to Moscow a few days before the execution. He stayed at Sverdlov's where he would have met Lenin. The two almost certainly broached the subject when discussing capital punishment as one of the powers of the people's courts. As the Whites approached the outskirts of Yekaterinburg, the Ural Soviet took the decision to execute the imperial family. It sent a telegram to Moscow addressed to Lenin and Yakov Sverdlov, the new regime's number two. This telegram stated that, owing to the military situation, the trial could not take place and that the Soviet had decided to execute Nicholas II. It also requested Moscow to inform the Soviet immediately if it disagreed with this decision. As time was short, the telegram was not sent in code. The Kremlin received it but sent no reply. The Soviet waited until midnight and then, at around 1 a.m., the order was given to wake the family and servants. This is Yakov Yurovsky's personal account of the execution. Nicholas turned to the commandant and stammered, What? What? The firing began and lasted two or three minutes. Nicholas was killed instantly, followed by Alexandra Fyodorovna and the servants, then Alexei. Three of his sisters were still alive. Something had made the bullets ricochet and fly around the room. It took almost 20 minutes to complete the task. When we undressed the corpses, we discovered that the sisters had been wearing garments full of jewels that had not been pierced by the bullets. The next morning, the leaders of the Ural Soviet sent a coded telegram to Lenin confirming the execution. Moscow announced Nicholas's death in the press, adding that his family had been evacuated. 
Lenin and Sverdlov were kept constantly informed of events in Yekaterinburg, but they chose to leave no trace of their decisions. This policy of leaving things unsaid soon became part and parcel of the Soviet system. People did not take the news lightly. They felt respect for the victims. I can recall my grandmother leaning on a windowsill with her eyes closed. She remembered the death of Nicholas I and used to tell us how, on hearing the news, her parents had cried and had locked themselves in their bedroom. Exactly the same thing was happening again, 50 years later. The Romanov execution marked the beginning of the new proletarian form of justice. At the start of the Civil War, the Whites made considerable advances and recaptured Bolshevik-occupied cities where they discovered the victims of the Great Red Terror. They showed no mercy themselves. Atrocities were committed on both sides. The Whites recaptured Yekaterinburg a week after the Imperial family's execution. Nicholas Sokolov, a judge during Nicholas's reign, was ordered to investigate what had happened in Nipatyev's house. He began a thorough inquiry. He discovered that the imperial family had indeed been executed on the night of July 17th, and that the corpses had been taken out of the city to be incinerated before being totally destroyed by sulfuric acid. Although Sokolov had nearly 1,000 men at his disposal, he didn't have time to complete his inquiry as the Red Army was approaching Yekaterinburg. The Reds recaptured the city in the summer of 1919. Sokolov stopped his investigation and never took it up again, at least not in any direct way. Geli Ryabov, a police officer and personal advisor to the Minister of Interior, took up Sokolov's investigation 50 years later. Sokolov was a very honest, kind-hearted man, and above all, a real professional. But he was a man of a bygone age. He belonged to what we in Russia call the Silver Age. He had not been brainwashed like I was by Yeshov, Beria, Yagoda and Abakov. They totally destroyed my life. I'm a different type of man. I know how the Bolsheviks' minds worked. If Sokolov did not find the grave, it's because he knew nothing about their mentality. He was in the right place, and yet he didn't find it. He would never have imagined men capable of concealing naked corpses under a road. I knew they were, and that makes all the difference. The Romanov's execution was soon forgotten. The new leaders focused all their attention on the great famines, which had decimated the population, the peasants' uprisings, and the difficulties of building a communist state. Guided tours of the imperial palaces were organized for the workers and peasants. They were known as museums of proletarian vengeance. An image of the Tsars as drinkers of the people's blood gradually emerged. Embodied by the new father of the people, Yosef Vissarionovich Stalin, the Bolshevik dictatorship took root in the former Russian Empire, which became the Soviet Union.
30 years of purges and communist propaganda created a new people, or rather, a new conformity. People like Gil Ilyabov and the geologist Alexander Avdonin, who still asked questions about the Romanovs' fate, risked being treated as dissidents. The first breakthrough in this veritable police inquiry involved Yakov Yurovsky, the commandant of Ipatiev's house. I learned that Yurovsky's eldest daughter was still alive, that she occasionally visited Yekaterinburg, and that she lived in Leningrad. On my return to Moscow, I got the militia to look for her. They located her and I went to see her in Leningrad. She was a fat old woman with a deep voice. She said to me, what do you expect me to say? Nicholas II was a bloodthirsty man. The party gave an order and my father executed it. Seeing that I was bitterly disappointed, she added, Listen, I have a brother called Alexander who's a bit crazy like you. He's interested in all these things. Go and see him. So I did. We spent all day talking and afterwards he said, I'm going to offer you the note my father wrote at the time. His personal account that is held in the government archives. He gave me a copy. Once I'd read it, I knew I'd found the burial place. During the night of July 17th, the naked corpses of the Romanovs and their servants were thrown into a derelict well some 30 kilometers from the town. The next morning, Yurovsky realized that the whole town knew about it. So the following night, he decided to dig up the corpses and, since there wasn't much time, ordered his men to hastily bury them under the road. His men poured 170 liters of sulfuric acid into the grave before covering it up and camouflaging it with brushwood. The secret was kept for 60 years. Ryabov and Avdonin did not find the mass grave until 1979. Exhuming a grave is always heart-wrenching. Digging up corpses was something I'd already experienced in the militia. I have to admit that I did it a couple of times, and it was terrible. But there are graves and graves. In this case, we knew we'd find the Romanovs. When one member of the expedition shouted, I can see some metal, I took a look and saw it was a green-colored hip bone. I thought to myself, that's not a bit of metal, it's a skeleton. There were all sorts of reactions. Cries, despair, disgust. We knew then that if anyone saw us, we would be imprisoned for life. I was very frightened. As soon as I realized it was the Romanovs, everything became very real. I knew my life was hanging by a thread. Do you recall the conversation between Pontius Pilate and Christ in Bulgakov's novel? Pilate says to Christ, your life is hanging by a thread, only I didn't know which thread my life was hanging by. I was very frightened indeed. Ryabov and Avdonin did not mention their find until 1989. In July 1991, an official decision was made to exhume the corpses. The imperial family's remains were dug up without the media's knowledge. The team consisted of KGB specialists, Yekaterinburg policemen and a few scientists. Alexander Avdonin was also present. It took two whole days and nights to remove the bones of the nine skeletons, which were half destroyed after almost 80 years in the damp earth. 
Such a significant find could not be hidden from the public, and when the news broke, it caused a wave of protest about the handling of the affair. People suspected the KGB of manipulation. A judicial inquiry was conducted in order to officially authenticate the bones. The remains were genetically analyzed four times, once in Great Britain, once in the United States in the Pentagon Laboratory, and twice in Russia. All four analyses came up with the same results. The skeletons were those of the imperial family. However, as two corpses were missing, it was necessary to positively identify each of the exhumed skeletons. A whole series of special photographic and plastic studies was conducted. The Institute for Space Research developed a computer program for matching computer-generated images of the skulls with photos of the imperial family. The nine skeletons were those of the Tsar Nicholas, his wife, three of their daughters, and four of their servants. The missing corpses were those of the heir Alexei and his sister Maria. Corpse number six was identified as Anastasia, thus putting pay to another myth about a Grand Duchess having survived. Sergei Nikitin, a specialist from the Center of Forensic Science, successfully reconstructed the external features of their heads using the skulls. I spent a great deal of time studying these bones. I had a far greater contact with them than any of the other experts here. After matching the photos and skulls on the computer, I embarked on the very long process of reconstructing the skulls. I also had to number all the bones. Basically, I was in very close contact with them for a number of months. I compared and examined photographs and films. It was as if they were alive. I saw them dancing, bathing, playing. They became like very close friends. Now each time I see them, rather than thinking this is skeleton number four, I refer to them as Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, or the Grand Duchess Tatiana. Naturally, I feel immensely moved by their fate. Remains were exhibited at the regional police center, where numerous experts and visitors, including the Grand Duchess Leonida, were able to see them. Leonida is the wife of one of Nicholas's nephews, considered by many Russians as the heir to the throne. My first visit to Ekaterinburg was an extremely moving experience. The bones were in plastic bags. When I returned just recently, they'd been moved into glass cases. But I still felt sad as there was not a single candle, icon or flower. I trembled with emotion. I have to say that it was one of the most painful moments in my life. I had the impression that they were all looking at me and were searching for some sign, an indication that God would welcome them as they deserved to be welcomed. Ipatyev's house was demolished in 1977 on the orders of Boris Yeltsin, then leader of the Yekaterinburg branch of the Communist Party. However, the spot on which it stood had become a place of pilgrimage for the many Russians who want to renew ties with their country's pre-revolutionary past and to forge a new identity following the collapse of the Soviet regime.
1991 marked a turning point in Russia's history. The decision was taken to call Leningrad by its old name of St. Petersburg. As heir to the throne, the Grand Duke Vladimir Kirillovich was officially invited for the occasion. It was the first time that a Romanov had stepped foot on Russian soil since the October Revolution. The Grand Duke Vladimir was so overcome with emotion that, just as we were climbing into the plane, he turned around, made the sign of the cross, and said to me, if anything should happen to me, have me buried here. I have found my true home here. This is my homeland. The Grand Duke was welcomed with the honor due to his rank. Although 70 years of communism have not managed to race the memory of the Romanov family in people's minds, some Russians cannot see the point of restoring the monarchy. Traditionally, the Russian Orthodox Church has never opposed governmental decisions. During the Soviet era, it was a question of survival. Today, it is a question of having survived. Nevertheless, it is divided over the internment of the Romanovs. Is this due to doubts about the Romains' identity, or because it is wary of becoming too involved in clearing the name of a dynasty it supported unquestioningly? It is important that the interment takes place, that it not be a symbolic tomb full of unidentified bones, but rather the tomb of the Romanovs, who were persecuted and tortured to death. It's important because a civil war has been raging here in Russia ever since July 1917. It is a savage war that has no rules. I'm sure that even Leon Trotsky, who led the Red Army and certainly knew a thing or two about executions, would tremble if he could see Russia today. Above all, this interment is important because it will put an end to the savagery. It's a form of repentance proffered by the people of Russia. Quite independently of the question of religion or nationality, it represents a refusal by the people to accept murder as a principle of existence, as an instrument. The people must renounce violence. In Russia, the internment of the Romanovs also raises the question of Lenin's tomb. In 1924, the government decided to exhibit his corpse so that each citizen could pay their respects to the leader of the International Revolution. Over the past 74 years, more than 70 million people have filed past Lenin's mummified corpse. In 1924, the idea behind the mausoleum was to give the population the possibility of paying their last respects to the leader of the international proletariat. I don't think people have finished doing this even today. Lenin. If you had asked me that question a few years ago, I would have angrily replied that the mausoleum should be blown up. Not now, though. I now think it is far better to leave Lenin where he is. Lenin is a monument to our unscrupulous, barbaric behavior of the past. Lenin is a monument, or rather a symbol, of all the base and vile acts we perpetrated. We can, indeed we must, come to terms with the past and keep the symbol as a reminder.